it's loading. Okay, we're ready. Okay, please so, record. Uh, record. Okay. 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 I cannot minimize. Yeah. So, welcome everyone. My name is Paula Rodriguez Arias, and together with Kimberly Puentes, we will be chairing this blog of sessions. We welcome to our first presentation of the Block of Concurrent Sessions. We also welcome the audience who is following us through our fan page. And please remember to mute your microphones and turn off the cameras during the presentation. So we're gonna start welcoming Professor Pablo Toledo and Nayibe Rosado from Latin American Association for Language Testing, who are presenting about thinking, teaching, testing, validity and alignment in the assessment of listening. We'd like to remind the presenters to stick to the 20 minutes. At the end of the session, there will be seven minutes for questions. Please, Paolo and Nayibe, you can start now. Thank you very much and good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everyone from, well, basically what is a dual setting because I'm based in Buenos Aires and my colleague Nayibe is not. Where are you today? Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm here in Valledupar in Colombia, South America. So in a warm part of Latin America uh, for which we cannot but be envious. So without further ado, let me start sharing my presentation with you today. So today we're going to be talking about thinking, teaching, testing, validity and alignment in the assessment of listening. Whenever we talk and we are basically going to be talking about one fundamental, if there is one thing that you want to know about assessment, it is basically what we mean in the assessment world by validity. Pretty much everything follows from there. On the minor side, validity is not an easy concept to grasp, and there are lots of discussions about what it is and how to define it. We are going to reference just one of those in a minute. We're going to be talking about validity. We're going to be talking about a framework for assessing listening in terms of what are the cognitive processes that go into it and what are the aspects that go into the assessment of listening. And we will be looking at basically the cognitive aspects of listening to look at the individual aspects of comprehension of listening comprehension or the of the listening cognitive activity that go into the assessment process and what makes listening difficult in terms of grading and how it works in different assessment frameworks the common european framework for reference for language in, uh, in particular and then we will be looking at what can be some assessment tasks which are used and why so pretty ambitious for the next 17 minutes let's have a go so don't panic, it's just assessment. We know that whenever we talk about assessment, there are lots of things that come into play connected with fear or connected with, oh, it's too difficult, it's too this, it's too that. Don't worry, it's just assessment. It's not the end of the world. And by the way, it is something that teachers do all the time. There is no such thing as learning and teaching without some kind of assessment happening. A teacher is pretty much by definition assessing at every moment they are teaching, assessing a reaction, assessing formatively. We can talk about how that is done in lots of ways, but assessment is integral to the teaching and learning activities. And the key thing about assessment and ba basically a lot of what validity is actually about, is about three things that have to align. Because what we, in this case, because we're talking about the assessment of listening, what we know about listening, how we teach listening and how we assess listening have to work together. If we have a theory of listening that goes this way, and then we teach listening in a way that is different from the theory. Well, as I am sure many other people in, in this conference are going to discuss, that doesn't work. And if we assess listening in ways which are different from the ways we teach and understand listening, then it definitely doesn't work. At the end of the day, 
yes, there are technical features that make different assessment instruments good or bad, that make them effective or non-effective by their own standards. But when we talk about, particularly about choosing uh, assessment instruments for our instruction, uh, the key question is not, is this a good test or a bad test, but is this an adequate test or an inadequate test? Is it a good fit for my purposes or is it not? And that brings us back to the concept of validity. But what is it? Validity is a concept that is central to assessment and it can be defined from two different angles or it has been defined in the history of assessment as a discipline in basically two different ways. We can understand validity as a quality of what we do with a test. So whenever we use an assessment instrument, we use it for something. We make a decision based on that, or we basically talk about an inference, some kind of judgment, some kind of argument, some kind of conclusion. It, can this person be admitted in a course or not? Can this person pass or not? Is this person ready to do this or not? And so we do something with that test. And validity can be defined in terms of what we do with that particular test. We can also, validity has also been considered a quality of the test itself, something that is in the design of the test or in the content. How? When we look at validity as a quality of what we do with a test, the basic definition, and this is a definition by Mike Kane, who is an extremely influential, sort of basically this is nowadays, this one is the definition that is mostly agreed on. If you look at the standards from the AERA, which we call the Bible of assessment, the definition of assessment that they have is very much in line with this. Uh, so the basic question is, are the inference or the decisions that we make based on the results of the test better than the decisions we would have made without the results? So you take a test and based on the test, you decide if a person is ready to pass or not, if you are going to uh, admit them in a course or not, et cetera, et cetera. Based on the results of that test, are you making a better decision than if you had done it by the observations that you had before or the, the information you already had before the test? So basically we are thinking of, is this test a good solid foundation for the decision, for the inference that we're going to make afterwards. If we think of assessment as a quality of a test, the question is a lot simpler. And this is the definition that Kronbach, and if you look at the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, up to the 90s, uh, this was the leading definition, which is basically, are we assessing what we say we are assessing? So if, for instance, if you, if you have a test of language competence, if you are assessing somebody's language competence, are you testing the competence in language and not something else? And are you testing everything that goes into competence? So in the case of listening, we have a test of listening comprehension, but we are only testing global listening and not detailed listening. Is that a valid test based on what we in assessment call the construct, what we should be assessing? At the end of the day, this would be like, is the test doing what it says on the box? If you look at the description of the test, is that a good fit? So this validity is the key quality that we need to look at in a test, and that is going to determine pretty much anything else that follows. So how do we assess? When we look at the assessment of listening, we need to have some kind of model or idea of the way listening works and based on that, how that can be assessed or how that should be assessed. So we are looking at one of these models. This is a derivation of the socio-cognitive model of assessment. I, I, am, I know that you are not able to read at this moment what is on the screen, that is, but that is on purpose, don't worry. And this, is, this comes from the socio-cognitive framework that was designed by Cyril Weir. And this is the adaptation that was done by a, uh, an international language uh, competence testing organization, which I'm not going to mention, but at the, end of the, at the end of the presentation, you will see my references and you will see the book that I took this from. So basically we start from 
test taker characteristics. There are things that each test taker has. So it can be a physical, physiological feature. It can be psychological thing, an experiential thing, blah. So this is our starting point, the lead thing. From that, oh, sorry, there. From that, we, we open up into two things. On the one hand, the aspects that are going to impact on the validity, we have the context validity. And context validity is anything that has to do with the um, context of the test, the content and the context of the test itself. So basically the tasks, the way in which you administer it, the kind of demands that are done uh, at the cognitive level. From the cognitive validity end, we have all of the processes, and we are going to go into this in a little bit more detail in a minute, that go into the processing of listening. So we need to take into consideration how listening works at the cognitive level, at the mental processing level, and then how that works, and then how we can test, test that or whether we are testing that. The interaction of all of these things, the test on the one hand, the cognitive processes with the input from the learner, from the test taker, go into building a response. After the response, the test need to, needs to be scored. And there are a number of elements that go into what makes the score of a test, the building of a result, what makes it valid or invalid, which are very technical and psychometric, and we are not going to go into those, definitely not. Then, once we have a score or a grade, the result, two things open up, two dimensions of validity open up. On the one hand, we have consequential validity, which is the interpretation of that score. The thing I was telling you at the beginning, if I'm going to make a decision based on that score, is that decision going to be valid or not? Is that decision going to be better or not? And the other thing is what is, what, what is called criteria related validity, which is if we compare that score uh, to what that, the, what that same test taker would have given, were the score that they would have been given on a different test using a different model or on the same test in another version, in another day, another year, et cetera, et cetera. Do they compare? Do they compare well to the frameworks and the external standards that we are using, the test that we are adopting in my university? Does it actually meet the national standards that I claim to be aligning to? So, as you can see, there are lots of things that go into how we assess listening. Let's start tackling some of them one by one. So, and we're going to begin by uh, cognitive validity, your brain on listening. And the things that I'm going to say now, very, very briefly, are things that I'm sure have already been covered by other speakers in this conference and will be covered. Uh, by other speakers, because this is basically what we mean by the way we understand listening actually happening. So what makes listening different from reading? Very basic. Number one is what I call gone with the wind. So there is no record of listening the way there is a record of reading. Uh, listening happens in real time. So I say something and it's gone. You cannot rewind, you cannot read again, etc. It, so because listening happens in real time and there is no record of it, you need to store information while you analyze it as a cognitive process. And then that information needs to be carried forward. I need to store it and I need to keep it on recall to make judgments about what I'm listening and to build an interpretation of what I am listening to. Then speech rate is not under the listener's control. I can say, please slow down, but I cannot actually make the thing slow down in, a, in an actual face-to-face -face conversation. Of course, with technology, I can slow down. Yes, you can. But in a conversation, if we think of interactive listening face-to-face, -face, I can ask the other person to do it. I cannot really do it for them. And there is variability. There are different accents. There are different styles. There are all kinds of things that make listening text, texts variable. And there are no gaps between words the way we have them in English and Spanish and most Western languages. We have spaces between words in, in typing, in writing. That isn't the case with all languages, but the languages that 
we come from in a Latin American conference, they do. And English definitely does. So two kinds of listening, and I'm going to be super brief because I know you know this. And if you don't know this, again, this is the subject of the conference. We have general and detailed listening, which we used to define in terms of what kind of information we want to get out, but actually makes more sense if we think of a kind of spectrum where we have the topic, the themes, the rima, uh, the schema on one end and the sound, the actual physicality of listening at the other end. Uh, we have top-down listening where we are thinking general comprehension, where we begin with, with, we begin with an idea of topic and then we narrow it down to some kind of understanding of what is going on. And then we have bottom up where we actually, in more in what we used to call detailed comprehension, we think more in terms of from the sounds we build uh, syllables and then bigger and bigger and bigger units. And from the physicality of the sound, we start building these super accurate or trying to be accurate about the way we listen to individual pieces of it. So two kinds of listening which cannot be assessed the same way because they are two completely different processes. So dialing in the difficulty, if we think in terms of assessment, we need to make decisions about what makes listening difficult or not. So what sets the level of a listening task? Listening needs to elicit cognitive processes that are appropriate to the target level. So what is uh, listening for advanced speakers cannot, we cannot ask them to do the same things that we do for less for beginner speakers. The common European framework gives us some contextual information which can help us design appropriate tasks. And we are going to look at that in a minute if that is a framework you choose to work with and it is the official one in Chile. So that is why we chose this one. And there are a variety of factors affecting the difficulty in addition to competitive processing demands uh, and those need to be controlled carefully. So what makes listening in another language difficult? If you have suggestions, please write them in the chat box as I move along. So, and here are some ideas or suggestions. There are issues of concentration attention, your level of interest, the processing time that you need, the complexity of the content, your background knowledge, your understanding of the context, and there are all kinds of intercultural, intercultural mediations going with it, the amount of visual support that you have or don't, uh, and identifying a speaker's purpose. Then there are, of course, the pronunciation features, which can be different from what you expect. There is the speed, there is the accent, there is the intonation, which works differently. Stress, if you're thinking of a sentence, of a syllable stressed language like Spanish, different from content stress, et cetera, et cetera. So what makes it difficult is things having to do with the content. So the linguistic complexity, content knowledge, nature of information, and things having to do with the speakers, your speech rate, your variety of accents. And very quickly, very, very, very quickly, let's look at the levels in the common European framework. And with these things in mind, let's look at what things are actually defined as the progression of the difficulty. Number one, A1, language is very slow. So a listener can follow, an A1 listener can follow language which is very slow and carefully articulated with long pauses. An A2 listener, uh, can understand expressions related to most areas of immediate priority, uh, provided that people articulate clear and slowly. Look at how speed, and then we have an introduction of the theme and then the pauses and the articulation. In B1, we are talking about clear standard language or a familiar variety. So we continue to expand the idea of the contextual and we begin to talk about varieties of language. And we talk about familiar matters regularly encountered. So we are going from very specific things to uh, the topic to contexts. B2 expands all of this. Uh, propositionally and linguistically complex discourse, concrete and abstract, standard language in a familiar variety. C1 expands that a lot more. And C2 basically says, you can understand anything this is not native speaker like because native speaker is not a category that the common European framework uses any longer, but it is comparable to. So this is the end of the time that we have for today. Uh, the idea that the question that I'm going to leave with you is thinking of all of these, 
what would be a good task for a Chilean B1 learner? And how can you think, what do you think will be the differences between a task for an A1 and a task for a C2? If we go all the way, a beginning, a middle and an end point, what would make the distinction between those two? Please type your suggestions in the chat box and type any questions that you may have there as well so that we can answer them now in the time we have for Q&A. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you, Nayibe. As Paulo said, we invite you to ask questions for the presenters. Also, feel free to turn on your cameras and the microphones. And of course, use the chat and all other Zoom, Zoom features. So Naive, we have either been so clear that everything has been explained or so obscure that there are no questions because people are asking what? Yeah, I think it's, it's always a challenge to, to communicate so much in such a short time, but thank you. Uh, maybe you could use the time if there are no questions, Paula, to yes. be, to think about what would be a good task for a Chilean B1 learner. Like considering this a context we all have and you all share, and how would that be different from uh, A1 and C2? Mm -hmm. And B1 is a critical level for most countries in Latin America, because if we think in terms of Chile, definitely Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, B1 is, the, is a level that is critical for things like uh, having access or graduating to university courses. So assessment assessment at that particular level and the switch from B1 to B2 and then uh, is kind of critical for most people going out of, second, of secondary education into university. Of course, people going into postgraduate education are going to find that the C levels are very critical, but uh, that is a much smaller number. So. B1 for most teachers, particularly teachers working in middle school, uh, high schools, and uh, non-English university courses is going to be a very critical one. Yes, it seems like Camilo has something to say about your presentation. Oh yes, um, thank you. Can you can you hear me well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I'm not going to try to answer the question that you left for us, but <laughs> I appreciate the presentation and, and all the information. Um, I was just thinking about one question that was posed in another presentation, one by Monica Cárdenas. So she's using um, AVC, which she calls, yeah, buttons to improve listening comprehension. Um, these are functions such as pausing, forwarding, or going back in you know, I think audiovisual material. And somebody asked about whether features like this one are finding their way into listening tests. Um, or for example, features like the ones you find on YouTube that where, you know, people can actually lower or speed up um, videos. Um, do you know how these might interact with listening or if you've seen features like this one moving into language assessment, um, listening well assessment? The, the issue is not, I mean, it's a, it's, a good, it's a good question. Thank you for that, Camilo, because it brings us back to the issue of validity. At the end of the day, whether it is technically doable or not is not the issue because, I mean, it is not about the technical feasibility of if you have a, an on-screen uh, listening test, you can very easily use those buttons and put them in the platform. It's not, it's not difficult. The challenge is, is it valid in terms of, is that a legit, is that going to distort what is what listeners are doing to the extent that this is not a test of actual listening communicative comprehension it is the same question as spell check in writing tests if you have if you think of if should you allow uh, learners who are doing writing in a course to use spell check for english if if typos are actually a thing that you are assessing now uh, on the one hand, you can say, well, yes, but in the real world, most English writers have a form of spell check available, just as most people, anybody watching YouTube today 
has uh, the option to slow down and rewind. So if you think in those contexts, your validity assessment can be, yes, this is still a valid form of listening because this is still assessing the way it happens in actual communication. If you are not worried so much about digital uh, consumption of text of listening, but if you're if you're thinking of a test that, that is for people who are going to go to university, for people who are going to travel, for people who are going to work and use English in spoken interaction, then I would say that you would definitely have issues of validity mm -hmm. because you are including in your test a feature that is going to affect the difficulty because it is going to impact on all of the dimensions of the difficulty of listening and uh, doesn't match the thing that that speaker is going to use in their actual purpose. So it would have, if you think that digital is not the main aim of language of listening for, the, for that particular test, if it is not in your, what is called the domain of the mm -hmm. test, then I would seriously challenge that. And I would say there are very good reasons why a listening test should not have that. Yeah. If you are thinking, if you are thinking of English for you too, sort of, mm. or if you include yeah. that in your understanding, then definitely yeah. you should have it. I was thinking, especially after you know, because of the pandemic, more and more interaction, listening interaction, and at the level of education and daily life is taking place through digital means, and mostly you can you have in most cases the option to pause, go back, lectures. Or when you when you when teachers are now uploading videos of their lectures at university level, no, um, I mean, have you seen that the, the construct itself of listening has shifted in the field as a result of the pandemic? Um, the the common European framework is a good is a good case in point. If you look at mm. the companion volumes of 2018 and 2020, mm. the each of the skills, first of all, we don't talk about four skills anymore, but mm. anyway, uh, if you look at listening, listening has been broken down into a digital consumption, interactive oh, listening, mediation for listening and all that. If you think of interactive, the, the role of listening in oral communication, whether it is Zoom or face-to-face, mm. -face, then I would say that 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 pausing, rewinding and slowing mm. down definitely breaks the construct, is not construct relevant. Mm. I mean, mm. you are looking at something that, I mean, right now, the two of us are speaking on a digital medium in yeah. English and you don't have the option to slow me down or rewind. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. so uh, on the other hand, if you're thinking of passive consumption of digital media, mm. then yes. So yes and no. Yeah, yeah, I see your point. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pablo and Ayibe, for a very interesting presentation. And we would also like to thank the audience for being here today in this session. So we invite you to our next presentation, which is captioning, implementing annotated keywords to foster listening comprehension. Remember that if you want to switch rooms, you have two minutes to do so. In the meantime, uh, Rocio, Catalina, uh, Ronald, you can start Hello. preparing everything for your presentation today. Thank I will you. start sharing my screen, okay? okay? Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Yes? Okay, great. So whenever you're ready, I'm ready. We are ready, actually. I think that, yes. We are ready to start now. So, hello everyone. Welcome to our second presentation of the block of concurrent sessions. My name is Paula Rodriguez Arias and together with Kimberly Puentes, we will be chairing this session. Please remember to mute your microphones and turn off the cameras during the presentation. Also for the audience following us in our Facebook live transmission, do not forget to leave your comments. Welcome Professor Catalina Lagos from Universidad Andrés Bello, and Ronald Dote y Rocío Rivera from Pontificia Universidad Católica de Valparaíso, who are presenting about captioning. We'd like to remind the presenters to stick to the 20 minutes. And at the end of the session, there will be seven minutes for questions. Please, the stage is yours. Okay, welcome. Uh, thank you for everyone for attending our presentation. 
Uh, yes, this presentation was prepared by Catalina, Rocio, and myself, but today Catalina and I will be the only ones presenting, okay? And this is a workshop. Basically, in this case, in this workshop, what we want to do, our intention is to provide hints and steps so as to use annotated keywords in your listening comprehensions in your classrooms so as to improve the students' overall comprehension of these listenings uh, so that they, to foster learning new vocabulary, specifically collocations in this case, and also the recognition of the speech segments, okay? For that, first of all, obviously, we will start with uh, defining some key concepts. We will refer to some research on which we base uh, our presentations, and then we'll get to the procedure to the workshop itself, okay? And now Catalina is going to present the theoretical framework in which we based our presentations. Okay, thank you, Bernal. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So we can show them our main ideas. Thank you. So first, we have to begin with listening comprehension, which is now considered to be an active skill rather than a passive skill. And we could even compare it uh, with uh, the audiolingual method back from the early 40s. So it is now something that we require our learners to um, have an, an excellent level, right? We need them to listen and to comprehend what they're listening. So first we have here in listening comprehension, we have two cognitive process, processes, uh, the bottom up and the top down approach. But first we're going to concentrate for this workshop, for this particular workshop, we're going to concentrate in the bottom up processing because here is when learners process information from the phoneme level to the discourse level features, okay? Uh, but there is also the top-down processing where learners uh, rely on the background content uh, and on the background and their context. And there are also things that um, we can say, for, for example, Rust from 2002 proposes that both processes are strongly connected in listening. But today in this workshop, we will concentrate only on bottom-up processing, okay? And we are also going to mention that captions uh, contribute better to learning than no captions. Why we meant this? Why do we say this? Because Vinkigas and Siorenko from 2010, they found that the captions are easier to comprehend some um, listening comprehension uh, videos or audiovisual material because they help us with novel vocabulary and overall comprehension, okay? So we also wanted to mention that this idea of uh, captioning also helps with uh, increasing students' motivation and reducing anxiety, which is one of the Krashen's comprehensible input theory main ideas. Uh, and it's also related to the amount of comprehensible input that our learners can receive from the captions. Next one, please, Rona. Thank you. Okay, so to define some things, some keywords that we're going to use here, we're going to, for example, explain collocations, which refers to a group of two or more words that usually go together, okay? Then we also have keywords, uh, which means key vocabulary, which can help us with difficult vocabulary or idiomatic expressions that uh, can be critical to understand or in a, in, in a listening, okay? We're also going to uh, talk about annotated keyword captions. That is a format that is similar to, uh, we could say pictorial representations of a reduced form, okay? And we are also going to talk about reduced forms, which are defined as phonological simplifications or variations by Ito in 2001. And I'm going to explain some of the four reduced forms here that are assimilation, elision, liaison, and reduction. First, assimilation occurs when you alter the original sound of a word because of the influence of an adjacent word. For example, here we have 10 mice. But when you pronounce it or when you hear it, you're going to hear that the N from the 10, it's more similar, it sounds more similar to the M of mice. So when you pronounce it or when you hear it, it's going to sound like 10 mice, not 10 mice. Okay, that's assimilation. Then we have elision, 
that is the omission of a speech sound. A clear example of this is the word captain, that if we pronounce it or overpronounce it, we're going to mention every word or every speech sound. I'm sorry, not word, speech sound. But uh, in a regular pronunciation or listening, you're going to hear it like captain. <laughs> okay, we also have liaison, which is the linking to a following word of proceeding, one by employment of the final sound. Okay, and here you're going to add, for example, an R. It's here now, you're going, the proper pronunciation would be here and now, but we tend to add another uh, sound for the pronunciation. And we finally have reduction, which is the reduction of an articulatory movement, which typically results in the elimination of a syllable, like the word probably, when you pronounce it, it's going to sound more like probably. Okay. okay. And now I refer to the referential framework. Uh, we based our workshop on two uh, pieces of research. The first one by Yang and Chang from 2014. In this case, these, uh, these authors, they wanted to investigate the impact of full caption, keyword caption, and annotated keyword caption on the uh, not only the, uh, the comprehension of the students uh, listening, also on the recognition of a speech segments. Um, because they, be they believe that the, the students or learners have problems understanding listening because they, are, they generally have a very short -term memory span. And that means that whenever they're trying to understand one segment in the video or listening, they are rushed right away into the following, right? So this will affect the comprehension of these listening. So by, uh, and so these authors, um, to conduct the research, they, they had three groups. The first group, they had um, uh, groups listening, watching a video with full captions. The second group with a, a keyword caption only, and the third group with annotated keywords. And they found out that the groups, the two groups that have keywords uh, captions and annotated uh, keywords were the groups that improved the most their performance. Also, we have Tanks from 2019 who uh, wanted to research how learners, le uh, how learners, right, uh, acquire new vocabulary, in this case, collocations, by using captioning in videos. And he concluded that captions has actually improved the learning of new vocabulary. Okay, now uh, I'd like to move to the workshop itself. Okay, uh, but first, although, before we do that, based on Yang and Chan's research, the annotated keyword for those of you who still are struggling with this uh, definition, here, for instance, in this case, we have um, this is the full caption, right? So this is sort of the script of the video. Then when we talk about the keyword caption, obviously we select only those words of chunks of words that are important for the meaning of the video or listening. And finally, the annotated keyword is, as Catalina said, this is like a pictorial representation of these reduced forms, right? Yang and Shan thought about the following symbols to uh, signal these uh, reduced forms. For instance, when they talk the simulation, they use a blue dot on this on the word uh, or, or sound that was assimilated. With liaison as well, they connected because it's connected speech, so they connected the sounds. With reduction, they use this color, sort of uh, gray, and with deletion, they just deleted the word, right? I know this could be difficult for us. We teachers, we do not have much time to do that. So we, we thought about proposing the following symbols that you can actually use when you um, produce captions in videos. So this is what the symbols that we suggest. First of all, in assimilation, we have this symbol right here between the two sounds that are assimilated, right? With liaison, we propose to have a double underscore right between the sounds that are connected. With reduction, we propose hashtag between, in between uh, or setting off the sound or syllable being reduced with hashtags. With deletion, we propose two hyphens together or the dash for that matter. And for a collocation, we propose using the color yellow simply, okay? Now, how do we do that? How, we, how do we add captions to our videos in this case? one free software that you can use is Filmora Wondershare or Wondershare Filmora, which you can download it for free 
right? And you can use it's a very useful uh, software. It's very easy to use. If you don't think you, if you think you will have, you will struggle with this, our suggestion, because this is what we went through, so we're talking from our experience too, is to go to YouTube and find many tutorials. There are many, full of them, that where you can learn not only to trim the videos, because sometimes we have videos that go for 10, 15 minutes, and we only like we only need a two-minute section, right? So you can trim the videos, uh, and also you can add the caption, okay? The sample that we will show you today in this workshop is a one minute video from the series Friends, right? And we use this one. And just like in the previous presentation, we're going to concentrate on the B2 level according to the Hammer European Framework of Language referenced. Uh, because this is like the crucial level that in Chile, at least, and I really understand in some other countries, is the level that is required in most universities. Most students need to graduate with this level. And also many schools as well uh, aim at having their students speak at a way to one uh, B1 level, okay? Uh, we chose this video as well because according to the cookies, uh, to the can do statements from this framework, these people, these independent students can actually uh, understand sentences, meaning if the topic discussed is familiar and obviously since Friends is a sitcom, we have situations that are very familiar, right? And like a tech talk, right? Where you need to know certain, you need to know to have certain background knowledge about a topic. But in this case, we are talking about a situation that could be familiar, right? And they can follow the main topics of extended discussion, provided the speech is clear in, and this is the most important part here, in a standard language. And we believe that friends does pose this, does represent this standard language. Okay. So um now you will, we will watch two samples from the same scene. The first one with uh, full captions, right? And the second one with the annotated uh, keywords. So please pay attention to that. First, we're going to watch the video with the full captions, which is this one. Hey, I got, yeah. got something for you. What's this? 812 bucks. Well, I don't know what Big Leon told you, but it's an even thousand if you want me for the whole night. <laughs> What is this for? Well, I'm making money now, and this is paying you back for headshots, electric bills, and so many slices of pizza I can't even count. I love you, man. Well, thanks, man. <laughs> now I can get my pony. <laughs> hey, this is a little extra something for, uh, you know, always being there for me. Wow, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Hey, what do you say? I don't know. <laughs> it's a bracelet, isn't it? And it's great too. Check it out. To my best bud. <laughs> Thanks, best bud. Put it on. Oh, now? I think something this nice should be saved for a special occasion. Oh, no, no, that's the beauty part. It goes with everything. Okay, so that is the version with the full uh, captions, but now we'll watch the version with the annotated keywords. That is, we selected some keywords in this video and we added these symbols, these pictorial representations, so that the students can identify the different speech segments. Okay, hey. I will start it over and there we go. Please pay attention to the captions that we have that we are presenting here. And again, we are presenting not only the collocations or keywords, keywords, but also we are using the pictorial representations. Hey, hey, one second. Hey, I got something for you. What's this? 812 bucks. Well, I don't know what Big Leon told you, but it's an even thousand if you want me for the whole night. <laughs> What is this for? Well, I'm making money now, and this is paying you back for headshots, electric bills, and so many slices of pizza I can't even count. I love you, man. Well, thanks, man. Now I can get my pony. <laughs> hey, this is a little extra something for, uh, you know, always being there for me. Wow, I don't know what to say. <laughs> wow, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> What do you say? I don't know. <laughs> it's a bracelet, isn't it? It's great too. Check it out. To 
my best bud. <laughs> Thanks, best bud. Put it on. Oh, now? <laughs> no, no, I think something this nice should be saved for a special occasion. Oh. Okay, so that is, and here we have a sample. First of all, I'd like to show you this here. We have a special location, this collocation, which we signal with uh, the color yellow, as we suggested in the in, in the symbols, right? Also, here we have an example, we have slices of pizza, and here we have connected speech or liaison, and here we have the double underscore that we suggest can be used to help students identify this segment, okay? And finally, here in the first part, um, here we have, hold on a second, right? So here we have another, uh, this chunk of language. Here, not only do we have a um, connected speech, but also here we have a reduction of this syllable, right? So this as uh, that could be, it's very simple for us as teachers, could be, could pose a big challenge for students to understand. But if they are oriented, if they learn the symbol and they, they watch the videos with these captions, that makes them easier to comprehend and later obviously to retain information. Okay, now Catalina will present the suggested questions that you can ask to uh, test comprehension. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, yes, we prepared four types of questions that, according to the paper that we read by Chang and Yang and Chang in 2014, we, uh, these questions would help us improve learners' performance. So what is the idea? There are four types of questions. Uh, the dictation clause, short dialogue comprehension, reduced form recognition, and reduced form marking. So each question type includes a mixture of four types of reduced forms, the ones that we saw uh, before, assimilation, liaison, reduction, and elision. Okay, and some of these questions now are in relation to the video of Joey and Chandler from, from France. The first one, uh, the first type of question corresponds to dictation clause. Here, learners are required to listen to the, to the video and fill in the blank of each sentence. So the answer may also be more than one word. Okay, we're very uh, familiar with these types of questions. The example here is, I think something this nice should be saved for us, and our students would have to uh, answer the special location. The type two questions are the short dialogue comprehension. Here, learners are required to listen to the dialogue and answer the question and choose from the best answer. So here we have this short dialogue between Chandler and Joey, uh, where Chandler says, what's this for? And Joey says, well, I'm making money now. So what does Joey mean? We have here some, uh, some answers. He is manufacturing money uh, or no, I'm sorry. Uh, the first one was, uh, he means that he won money in the lottery. He means that he hasn't got that much money. Uh, he means that he's paying back his debt now and he has a job. Or he means that he, um, the fourth one is that he's losing money. So, and the correct answer here would be letter C. Okay, he means that he's paying back his job. And we also have the type three type of questions, the reduced form recognition, where here learners are required to choose from the correct reduced form annotation based on what they heard, okay? So for example, we have, uh, it's an even thousand. So our learners would have to recognize which kind of um, reduced form is the correct one. So we have assimilation, we have liaison, we also have um, the, the third one was, reduction. Uh, reduction, yes, I'm sorry, reduction. And the correct answer here would be, the fourth type is reduced form marking, where here learners are required to listen and mark each sentence with the appropriate reduced form symbols uh, without multiple choices. So here you just give them like the sentence and they have to write the, the symbol that you gave you give your students. OK, so here they would have to write, I don't know, with the assimilation, the assimilation symbol. Okay, so, uh, so a conclusion very fast, uh, this captioning, this reduced caption and uh, full captioning, keyword caption and reduced caption does improve the learning of new vocabulary. It also improves the overall listening comprehension. And since it helps with the novel vocabulary, it improves the acquisition of new vocabulary, in this case, collocations. And very fast suggestions before we finish, uh, learn how to use this software. 
watch the videos on tutorials. And once you choose the symbols that you believe will help your students, or we, you can use the ones that we suggested, teach those symbols to your students, practice them, and then do the listening uh, comprehension and use the questions suggested, of course. I hope it is, we made it on time, right? Yes. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Ronald and Catalina. I don't know if the audience, do you have any questions for the presenters? Remember, you can turn on the cameras and your and open your microphones. So. If you're a bit shy, you can also use the chat. Don't worry. <laughs> Well, if you don't, any questions or uh, further suggestions is that this, even though it may seem very difficult to do, like challenging, and given the time we have as teachers, especially in these times of pandemics, really uh, learning how to use this is not so difficult, but and really don't do it on your own, but get help from YouTube. YouTube is a great tool to get tutorials. I actually learned how to add captions in 10 minutes because I really found a very good uh, a very good tutorial and actually I included here this um, the link to this tutorial in one of these slides and by the way you do have my email in here so if you need this presentation if you want me to send you further information here is the link so you can learn how to add the captions to this video to your videos using this uh, software and as well these tutorials on YouTube. Yes, maybe we can post the link later on when this presentation is posted on the fan page so that all of you can have access to this um, platform. We have in the chat Jimena Baceta, who says very interesting and great way to help students. I agree. And a question from Rocio, who says, do you think this is something you would like to use in your classes to develop listening? This, class, this question goes to everyone, to the audience. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> It's not against yeah. for us. So maybe if the audience doesn't have a question, the presenters do. So please, audience, please, Dani, Dani, Andrea. This could Sebastian. be very interesting because you can adapt this to your student needs. It's like when you find a video or you get materials from your for your classes, that material that is published is usually for uh, the whole line of books. But here you can just find a video that might be interesting to your students. In this case, we chose Friends, but what about your students like other series, right? So you can take the series, the TV series that your students like, they prefer, and you can adapt them for their needs. So that's another advantage, right? Because the students will feel much more interested in learning English if they, they, if they see that they are watching something that they like and that is adapted for their needs. So we have a question now from Mariana, who says, do you think it might be difficult for your students to remember all the symbols? Uh, not really, not really. Uh, again, you don't need to work with all the um, reduced forms, but you can work with four, three, or five of them. So start little by little, probably progressively, including more and more symbols. And you can always, and as I said in my suggestion, include symbols that are easy or easy to remember, right? Not symbols. and easy to remember and this is, as this is annotated keyword, try to have one or two symbols per section, no more than that. If you have three, then you post another challenge. But my suggestion is one symbol per segment or at, at two at the most. Good. And we have also another question from A. Oh, PA. PA. I think it's PA, <laughs> yes. Yes. How about asking students to create captions for their favorite TV shows, for instance, as an assignment? You can also do that, yes, yes. so that students yes. can recognize the segments and they use the symbols as well. So go works both ways. You can use it as, as teacher and your students can use it as obviously students and recognize these, yes. these uh, speech segments, reduced forms. And Roxana asked about how much time does it take to prepare this material? Good question, Roxana. Uh, Katarina, would you like to answer that? Or yes, I uh, well, I, I have to give the credits to Ronald uh, in terms of the, the captions and the, the creation of this video. Uh, he did it, <laughs> the, that part. But um, I also um, went to the link, I went to YouTube, I learned how to do it as well. But I think that if you plan ahead, you can count on the time. And if you practice how to do it, it will become easier eventually 
it's not that difficult. The thing is that you have to get used to to the the um, the elements of the of the platform. Exactly, the first time could be difficult, uh, frustrating, time consuming, but later on. It, it gets easier, much, much easier. And believe me, in this two minute video, it took me the first time about 40 minutes, I'm not lying. But later I did it again over and over and it was much, much easier, much faster too. Okay, nice. thank you. Uh, yes, now I will uh, like to share some comments and I we have a question from Facebook. So let me share with you. Uh, uh, for example, Daniel Beck Miranda says, spoken English is definitely a very interesting topic to study. So many subtle changes that can improve speech. So he really liked your <laughs> presentation. Um, and we have uh, another uh, comment. Awesome workshop, you're great. And here we have uh, the question from Felipe Gomez. Have you been able to implement this in high school level sessions? No, so. not in high school level. No, unfortunately not. But I think it's going to be, it would be a great idea to do that. And if you need help, Felipe, with that, you have my email so I can help you with it. And it would be a great experience. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Professor Dote, Catalina, for thank a very you. insightful presentation. Uh, we would also like to thank the audience for the questions. And we invite you to our last presentation, which, which is, is how to foster L2 listening skills with flipped learning. So if you want to switch rooms, remember you have two minutes to do so. Thank you everyone for being here. So lady, lady, are you there? You can start preparing everything for your presentation. Hey, Paula, how are you? Can you hear Fine. me? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, is the sound okay? Yes. Perfect. Let me start by sharing my screen. Just let me know whenever you want me to start, okay? Okay, we're gonna wait uh, maybe like a minute if someone else is waiting okay. to join your presentation. Okay, sounds good. Well, we see some, a very interesting interaction in the chat, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if someone else wants to jump in into the new research team that is being created right now. <laughs> that sounds interesting. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, so in that now we are ready to start with your presentation, lady. <laughs> okay, perfect. Do yeah, you want me to so start now? Let me introduce yourself first. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so everyone, we welcome Professor Lady Joana Villamizar from Universidad Santo Tomás. We'd like to remind the presenter to stick to the 20 minutes. And as usual, we, have, we will have seven minutes for questions. Lady, you can start now. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much for coming to this session. Thank you very much, Paula, for your presentation. I really find uh, teaching and listening, you know, super connected. And I'm glad that you joined this um, session for today. Okay. So um, as Paula introduced me, my name is Lady Joana Villamizar Castrillon. I've been working for Santo Tomas University here in Colombia for the last six years. And we have already implemented flip teaching in our sessions, in our classes. So today I'm gonna to be sharing with you a little bit about our work, you know, how we're doing it, how gradually we're implementing flip teaching. It is something that we cannot just approach, you know, overnight. We have been learning a lot, studying a lot, learning from our students. 
So I hope that you find this presentation quite useful too, okay? So uh, the first thing that we need to talk about is kind of like the outline of the session. So I'm going to show you like the agenda for today, okay? The words of outline. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about challenges EFL students face when developing listening skills. This is more like a discussion. So everybody feel please free, uh, feel free to raise your hand, activate your microphone during this first part, because this is a lot of discussion. You know, I want to hear from you guys from your own practices, teachers too. Okay. Number two, we're going to uh, talk about L2 listening strategies before, during, and after a listening task. Three, flip learning benefits of foster listening skills. And four, sample activities. Listen to speak and listen to write. We're going to concentrate and listen to speak mainly on this session, okay? So let's start by talking about challenges, okay? I have created on uh, menti.com. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this uh, application, with this uh, tool, but uh, menti.com allows us to have like a general survey, you know, apply a survey to our students and they can send their responses anonymously. So they will know, you will not know who actually sent the answer. It's like anonymous, but the idea is to collect some insights from you, the students, you know. Um, it's useful when you start a class and you want to get some background knowledge from them too, okay? So for this Menti, uh, you can easily uh, take your phone and scan the QR code that is at the bottom right corner of the slide if you want to go right there. Or you can just go, to uh, the website www.menti.com. They will ask you for a code. The code is code 783 And once you enter the code, it will allow you to share your opinion about only two questions. This is just, you know, like two questions I'd like you to share. Um, what about your practices, you know, your reflection about this particular question? Challenges? EFL students face when developing listening skills, okay? For those who already joined the QR or who are uh, trying to join through the website, once again, menti.com and the coach is right on the screen. I'm going to uh, move to the website so you can see the question that we have over here, okay? I already see one participant, excellent. And the question, uh, Again, it's the same question we had in the presentation slides. What do you think are the most common challenges EFL students face when developing listening skills? If you ask me, you know, personally, I feel that sometimes it's a lack of confidence. Sometimes the students feel like too nervous when the listening starts, you know, and they eventually, you know, start the audio, start the first part, they get it. And they, it comes to a point where maybe they find a word that they don't know, or maybe an expression, and then they get stuck. Sometimes it feels it's a matter of confidence. Other times, maybe just a matter of vocabulary. Maybe our students are not really into vocabulary much. They kind of learn it for short-term periods of time, but they then forget. They, they don't practice it, so they forget it, right? So uh, that can happen. Okay, this, uh, I love memes, I love cartoons, and uh, here on the screen you have uh, one from The Simpsons. So here is Omar saying, hey, can you repeat that part of the stuff where you said all about the things? <laughs> so if you think about that question, many times, many of our students may be feeling this way, right? A little lost, a little like, like nothing, but they may not be understanding a word. So um, we need to actually put ourselves in their shoes, right? In this Monday, um, once you enter to the website, it will allow you to write three words, okay? So I wanted to write those three words that are connected to challenges, you know? Excellent participation. As you can see on my screen, uh, the website will uh, let me uh, show you kind of like a word cloud. And in this word cloud, you will see lots of words in different colors, in different sizes. So it, these are all the answers that you have been sending through the application, okay? Yes, you're definitely right. We have challenges such as decoding sounds, that's a problem. Lack of practice, that's true. 
classroom equipment mm -hmm. pass a speech definitely that's a good one to get required information many times they get like the whole picture but maybe they don't get into the specific information we ask uh-huh lack of vocabulary true proficiency levels that's an important one thank you for sharing that sometimes we plan our classes um, with vocabulary or uh, exercises that are too high for the level of our students that can happen right anxiety that's definitely happening sometimes understanding and concentration yep absolutely right thank you for sharing your answers here now let's move on to our second question our second question is multiple choice and uh you will be allowed to choose from the options on the screen so what is at least an sub skill that you teach the most on the right side of the screen you have some options is it listen for gist you know like listening and get the general ideas or maybe it's the second listen for details you want your students to go into specific information you know maybe it's a number maybe it's a date you know maybe it's listening to opinions sometimes you get a students you know into uh getting the opinion of a specific speaker you know we want them to identify that specific expression like in my opinion you should or oh, i think you should do this you better right so maybe we're looking for those uh strategies or maybe we want our students to listen for a sequence you know think about that uh, beautiful exercise sometimes we do where we have lots of images right and from the images we start um asking our students to organize them you know like make a sequence maybe it's a recipe and we want our students to organize the pictures in the order that it corresponds right or sometimes maybe it's a story we want our students to listen to the story and according to the audio organize the specific events right so according to this uh survey we are using here uh most of the time teachers at least the teachers today in this session tend to listen for details and that's actually uh, good you know we want our students to concentrate on specific information the rest of the participants 25 percent voted for listening for gist or many times we do a combination you know sometimes we listen for this first and then we listen for details and maybe then we leave and then we maybe we ask our students to um, make and predict uh, you know like make predictions and check understanding later so there are many sub skills we can concentrate but for so far we're going to be using details for today's sample thank you for your participation now uh now that i get i got some information from you we're going to start with the strategy part okay so l to listen in strategies yes we definitely know we all know that when we um when we deal with a listening activity we need to organize our session with a before listening task during listening task and after a listening task yeah we get to know our students ready for the activity you know and that's why here we talk about activation of the students prior knowledge it is absolutely important they need to know at least what the topic of the audio will be what kind of context is the situation in right and then we need to get them prepared for listening you know maybe with a vocabulary list check definitions and check contexts or concepts you know before starting with the audio right during the listening task of course teachers need to build up students listening skills so they need to know what to do right so during the listening let's say we're going to play the recording three times the first time please concentrate on general ideas or answer the question where are the people at the moment let's say right the second time let's concentrate into details pictures matching numbers right and then finally maybe on a third time we can have this uh the chance to confirm our answers right um and of course we have after the listening task this uh this this part is absolutely important because teachers need to assess the students progress it's not only just to give them the answers right but it's to explain in detail why they got it right or why they got it wrong right 
And if there is a need to repeat the audio one more time, or maybe share the audio for the students to play it on their own, that would be the best, right? Now, let's talk a little bit about sleep learning. You know, I know that many of you, or maybe most of you are familiar with the concept. I don't know if you have heard about flip learning or flip teaching, a flip classroom. You know, it's, these are like synonym expressions. Have you heard of these uh, before? You can activate your microphone, don't be shy. Can I say something? Sorry. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I'm listening. So well, I'm Andrea from Puerto Natales, and last year we were invited to participate in a kind of training for free classroom. Uh, wow. It was Telefonica something. Okay. I don't know, probably other colleagues have participated too. And did you but, like it? Was it like helpful for you for your teaching practice? Yeah, yeah it, it was, um, well, um, yes, it's interesting, but it was, um, Sure thing. I mean, I I think I I think that is a it's a very interesting um, approach. But I think we have we or we ha should have participated in something deeper. I mean, it's it was oh, like I understand. Short. Yes, I understand. It was maybe like a very general like yes, brief. something like that. Thank you. Okay, okay. That, that is what Thank I you, That's why that's what I know about flip classroom. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, well, in Spanish is aula invertida. That's actually the version, you know, in, in, in Spanish. But again, you know, this is a big concept that is started in North America, in North America many years ago. And it is started uh, not with language teachers, you know, but with um, chemistry teacher and a mathematics teacher, you know, they just started developing this strategy, you know, in their schools with their own classes, you know, there were it was kind of like a trial and error approach, you know, and it eventually became so popular, so effective that they just started implementing it in many different classes, you know, including, of course, English, Spanish and so on. OK, so the definition I'm showing you right now on the screen is actually by the Flip Learning Network in 2014. And here they explain, you know, how the concept of teaching is presented in a different way, you know. So when we talk about flip learning, we necessarily need to compare it to the traditional approach, right? Let's say in the traditional approach, we typically um, give our students all the content, guiding instruction, you know, and then eventually when they practice in class a little, just a little, we send our students to, uh, to you know, home for homework. And sometimes the homework can be just very tough, very complicated. They struggle because they're alone, they're at home, they don't know who to ask, you know? And then the, the process continues, you know? It's, it's very teacher-oriented when we think about our traditional approach, right? But flip learning, you know, uh, and the concept or the approach of that, uh, the way they conceive it is the opposite. It's switching these two spaces or these two environments. So the student, is uh, engaged before the class with some materials, with some reading, with some videos, with some podcasts, you know? They activate the knowledge with that material first on their own, right? And they come to class to practice. They don't come to class, they don't come to class, you know, just like, teacher, what do, or, do we have to do today, right? They already have some background knowledge, some background content, and they use it in the classroom for playing, for uh, debates, for interaction. So there is more space in the classroom, you know, not for lecturing, not for diet instruction, but for the real practice. And maybe for the activities that we want to do and many times we run out of time. You know, this activity, uh, this uh, game, this competition, this reflection, right? And then at the end, um, the students are doing actually the practice or what we call homework with the help of the teacher in the classroom. So somehow the student is actually the center this time, right? But uh, the teacher is always there, right? The teacher is always guiding the student. Think about the benefits. What are the benefits um, of flip learning? We have some of the benefits, as you can see on the screen, shared by Fulton 2012. Fulton says that, um, you know, flip learning, when it's oriented towards specific our area, you know, second language teaching, foreign language teaching, it can increase uh, 
uh, students' independence and freedom, you know, because the students are kind of like engaged in the process. So if the teacher assigned a short video to watch at home, they can play it the number of times they want. They can uh, use it for review, you know. Um, they can uh, save it for, you know, for uh, later if they want to watch it later. So that's kind of independence and uh, that kind of independence and flexibility is actually good for the student. You know, we need to let go somehow and have the students have control. The second, of course, is used for large classes when several students miss a lesson and, of course, for different pace variety. Now, with COVID-19, you know, all the world, all the students in the world had to go to online, le online lessons, online classes. And um, many times we don't really know the reality of our students, you know, we don't really know how the students are feeling, how our students are uh, dealing with all this situation of the pandemic, right? And many times they may be having a hard time at home with their families, you know? So sometimes if they have to miss a lesson, because we have those cases, uh, we can perfectly and easily lead our students to, hey, remember this material we have, we have this uh, Moodle website, or we have this account, or I can email it to you. And to somehow all these resources help us to get the student, you know, into the session, okay? Catch up to the session. Of course, it increases the student's interaction. It promotes mastery because the more the practice, the better, right? It humanizes the classroom to, through informatics, through, you know, in uh, uh, technology. And it supports it, this big concept of one size doesn't fit all, that is a concept that I personally like really much. That is the concept of differentiated education. Right, the fact that every student is different and every student learns in a different way, different pace, in a, in a different with different strategies. Right, so that's what we're trying to do with flip teaching. You know, trying to get our students differently, trying to be very flexible. Okay, now let's go to practice. Let's think about a flip lesson. Um, listen to speak. This is what we have been doing at Santo Tomas University here in Colombia. Uh, it's a total we have, uh, our students are pretty much, uh, they have access to both, of course, our synchronous classes through Teams, and they have uh, access to uh, the website. It's, it's like a campus virtual, you know, like a virtual campus uh, in Moodle. And through Moodle, we have all the records, all the resources we need for flip teaching, okay? So here on this slide, I'm showing you uh, three different resources or activities that we typically suggest for our students to do out of class. So this is like students independent work, okay? So before coming to my class, I want my students to be engaged in the topic. I want my students to listen and practice for the class, okay? So that's why the first step is to watch the flip video that is typically created by the teacher. So in my case, for example, I have been working on this strategy for teaching for uh, four years now, and I have been had well, I have the chance to uh, create lots of resources with other colleagues, you know. So we uh, look into the materials, we select certain classes we want to flip, and then we create the resources for the next semester. So of course, it's a lot of work because we need to really analyze the needs of our students, what lessons are really useful to flip, you know, and then we start recording our sessions, you know, like we typically, we are normally in the videos, they see us, they listen to our voices. So that familiarity, you know, is something that students really like. Here, for example, in this slide, I'm showing you a very short, a uh, small picture that it says, um, video 10A, how many bedrooms are there in your house? So this is one of the resources we created for our students in level two, that is kind of like a, uh, like a pre-intermediate level, like an A1 plus level, okay? And of course, from the title, you can tell that here in this um, video, the students get to practice the use of uh, there is, there are, and vocabulary about homes, you know, furniture, appliances, all that, right? Once they watch this video out of the lesson, out of the class, they, uh, they go to step two, that is to learn from a cultural video clip 
that is typically a curated material. Remember that when we talk about curated materials, we're talking about um, resources that are already in the internet, but we take them, we adapt them according to the needs of our students and according to our personal objectives for our lessons, right? And then we create some kind of questionnaire. That is step number three. We take our students to Moodle and here they have a video check-in. That's how we call it. That is of course a Moodle questionnaire. Okay, this is what students are doing out of the lesson, you know, they know that once a week, they will have these resources available, you know, for seven days. Uh, first video created by, created by the teacher, second short clip, where they see, for example, uh, a couple of people interacting in real life about the content of this unit, you know, they will be talking about homes, or they'll be talking about decorations of the apartments, right? And once they have watched the first video by the teacher and the video clip from, uh, you know, from the internet, they will be um, going to the video checking to check, you know, what they understood, what they listened to uh, in the previous resources, right? Um, once they have done these, you know, they come to class, this is the next part. And during the class, during the session, here is where the teacher guided work starts, right? So here I have step four, five, and six. Step four, of course, we have a free activity, you know, where we set up a sub skill and we give clear instructions. Here on the right side of the screen, for example, I'm showing you a very uh, small picture, sorry about the picture. But uh, here, for example, this is an exercise of an international student who is moving to Canada to learn English and uh, he needs an apartment, right? So this student is looking for an apartment that is not so big because he has not much money, not so small because he still needs some space, right? So along the conversation, he has this friend, Amy, who is giving him some options, three different apartments to choose, three different prices to pay, right? So after we said, after, for example, in this particular lesson, I set up the tone, you know, of the activity, and I tell them specifically, hey, you're gonna be listening three times, first time for general understanding, second time for specific information, like organizing the pictures or getting a number, right? And third time for confirmation, they get to a uh, part, they go to part five, right? Part five, of course, will be playing the audio, matching pictures, writing numbers. And then the fun part is number three, because after we have been doing all this work out of class, during class, they come to the post activity. And this post activity is where I invite my students for um, doing the practice session, you know, that listen to speak. Well, I invite my students to record a response in Flipgrid. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Flipgrid, with the application of Flipgrid, or maybe have you heard of it? Here is the logo. Maybe if you look at the upper side of the screen, you'll see the logo for Flipgrid. Have you used it? Uh, uh, have you heard of it? Yeah, they are answering in the chat. And Roxana okay. says yes, Naive says yes too. <laughs> Thank you for helping me with the chat. Yeah, I'm, I appreciate uh, it. Here's someone, Andrea Vivar. Uh, she said, not me. She, she's not familiar with it. <laughs> okay, great. Well, <laughs> well that's, that's good to know because, again, I've been using Flipgrid for the last year, let's say. I, you know, I don't know how old this website or this application is, but it's one of the uh, websites I'm using the most right now. I want my students to speak. And I love what I love about this website is that uh, once I have been doing all this practice out of class and in the classroom, I tell them, okay, guys, you're going to record yourself describing your own bedroom. Now I want you to think about your own personal space. And I want you to speak, let's say, for about 30 seconds or a minute. You know, when, they, when you tell your students that is this short, you know, 30 seconds or a minute, they feel like I can do it, right? And of course, I give them some questions to start this description. So I tell them, hey guys, remember, um, you can describe the size of your room, the objects you have there, 
the location. So this is a good practice for prepositions of place, location, words, mm -hmm. right? And finally, give me your opinion. Why do you like your room? What is special about that personal space, right? So with those questions, I uh, normally recommend them to do kind of like a mind map because with the mind map, they can organize uh, their notes about what they want to say. And once they organize their ideas written, you know, they can move on into the recording in the website. You can record it with only audio or you can record it through a video too. It depends, you know, it gives you lots of, lots of uh, gadgets and things, you know, for a video edition. They also like that. And what I personally like as a teacher is the fact that I, I know what my students are doing now. So here, for example, I had 12 responses, 81 views. That means that they could listen to their uh, classmates, you know, answers. We, I, was, uh, I was able to listen to my students' answers, of course, but they could listen to each other's too. And they are always curious, like, hey, I want to know what Sebastian uh, said. So they will listen to Sebastian and keep engaged for 1.2 hours. So this is cool because the website gives us some statistics about the engagement time. And that's actually good for us because they are not listening to the teacher all the time, but to classmates. And listening to classmates also counts towards, uh, you know, uh, language performance and language competence, okay? Here is my Flipgrid account. I don't know how many minutes I have. Uh, Paula, can you help me with time? One minute. <laughs> one are, minute. That's no time for questions. <laughs> Sorry, that's what I thought, yeah. So here in the Flipgrid, for example, this is the Flipgrid I created for my students. Uh, all the responses of my students are at the bottom, you know, and uh, as I said, uh, the first person who posted, for example, was Santiago and, uh, the, the other classmates watch uh, and listen to him uh, like 15 times, you know? And then eventually uh, they could decide to do maybe a video or an audio. And for example, here I have Daniela, let's pick a random student here, for example. The website allows you. Hi, my name is Daniela. And I will like to describe my bedroom. I think that my bedroom is not so big or so small. It's more like me. Something that size. I wanted to uh, share with you is that the website has the possibility to generate automatic captions. So the students record themselves and then they can activate the, the captions to see how close the speaking, you know, their speaking and their pronunciation is to the real, you know, the real words. So it's actually a good exercise for them. They can listen to themselves. And when they listen to themselves, they get to see, you know, oh, I need to work better on the pronunciation of this or that, or I need, or I'm really good at this, I, I, it sounds good, or no, it sounds kind of weird, I need to practice more, right? Uh, this is it. I wanted to share with you guys this really cool website. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for being here. This is my email address in case you want to uh, text me. Just uh, I can share this presentation with you guys. I have already shared this presentation with the organizing committee of the conference. So uh, in case you want to check some additional references, uh, for additional research or additional reading, uh, you are welcome to use them. These are really useful. And uh, again, thank you very much for watching. Thank you, lady, for this presentation about uh, flipped lessons. I think it's something new for some of us. And we would also like to thank the audience for being here today. And mm -hmm. uh, I would like to remind you to watch our two wonderful classroom-based listening research videos, okay? We hope they understanding work proves useful for your future practice. You can watch them online during the coffee break. And I'm gonna send you the links right away so you can visit them with your cup of tea, your cup of coffee. And of course, uh, we, Again, thank you for being here, for attending, and we will see you today for the presentation of our keynote speaker, Maribel Montero Perez. I'm gonna share with you the link for the presentation.
So you can have it in hand. And uh, I send it to Kimberly. <laughs> so there's the link for the for the keynote speaker and the links for the listening for the classroom based listening research. Thanks again for being here today and we see you soon. Thank you, lady, again. Thank you very much. Thank you so Bye. much. I'll see you next time. Thank Stay you safe. Listening. Take yeah. care. Take care. Make sure you visit the links. Don't forget. Yes. <laughs>